It's not often these days that a new IP arrives into mainstream gaming and leaves such a mark, especially in a time where reboots and remakes are coming out more and more as new ideas become less prevalent due to studio executives' fear of risk. I mean, why risk millions of dollars and years of effort when it may just fall flat on its face? That is the current climate of the gaming industry. Yet one studio opted for the path of greatest resistance. A relatively unknown studio from a country where mobile gaming massively overshadows console games. A studio that has never made a AAA game before. A studio that on their first try absolutely freaking nailed the landing. That studio was Shift Up. And this is how their game Stellar Blade shocked the world. To start off, we can't talk about Stellar Blade without first mentioning its almost Cinderella-esque development. Shift Up Studio, based in South Korea, was and is a mobile game developer. A platform of gaming intensely popular in Korea, they had quite a few popular mobile game hits such as the narrative RPG called Destiny's Child, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Nikkei goddess of victory. I don't think I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> Having pretty resounding success in that space, the director and CEO Kyung Tae Kim, I hope I got that one right, was setting his eyes on his most ambitious project ever. He wanted to break into the AAA gaming scene, and being heavily inspired by games such as Nier Automata and Dark Souls, he wanted his game to be built around a similar concept. The game was first announced under the working title of Project Eve in 2019 to a mostly lukewarm reception because honestly, nobody knew them. To most, it was nothing more than a graphically impressive demo that would never see the light of day, believing that the director and his team had bitten off more than they could chew. But Hyung Tao Kim had a vision and a philosophy behind his idea of video gaming. And his ambition wouldn't be easily shaken as he got to work, drawing inspiration from titles such as Nier Automata, as well as other pieces of media from popular culture, including Akira, Blade Runner, and the Japanese manga Battle Angel Attila. The process to create such a game was admittedly no easy feat. The game, according to Kim, was designed to appeal to as many gamers as possible. It, he wanted a bit of everything in this game. And as we'll discuss later in the gameplay, he did kind of have a bit of everything. But after five years of grueling trial and error, Stellar Blade arrived on the April of 26th, and boy oh boy did it arrive in style. If I had to describe Stellar Blade's gameplay in three words, I would say stylish, over the top, and absolutely freaking satisfying. Following the growing trend of Souls-like games, Stellar Blade takes heavy inspiration for its combat mechanics from Sekiro's parry system, while the semi-open world exploration is more akin to the post-apocalyptic setting of games like Nier Automata. The game developers must have felt pretty confident with their game because a month prior to the release, they released a free demo. And in this day and age, that's unheard of. I mean, how many studios can you think about that release a fully playable demo a month before their game is supposed to come out? I mean, <laughs> That's crazy to me. That's actually crazy. And you know me, alongside many others, just jumped at the opportunity. And the short of it was, um, I freaking loved it. The game's core gameplay is simple to understand, but takes time to master, as you really only have two weapons in the game, but a bunch of skill moves that help you manage through the game's dark and brutal world. It's a familiar setup. Fusing features of Souls-like games with those of flashy hack and slashes such as Devil May Cry or Bayonetta. And the core concept is simple enough. Big enemies coming at you, dodge and parry their upcoming attacks, waiting for your chance to counter. Meanwhile, each parry breaks down the balance of the enemy, similar to how Sekiro does it. And finally, when you've broken it down to a certain point, gives you this insane visceral attack that does huge damage. Rinse and repeat and move on to the next enemy. This is also accompanied by a drone gun you can use 
Though, if I'm being honest, it, it was one of the lesser points of the game because it wasn't really great. It was there, it was okay, kind of reminded me of Dead Space, especially some of those underground you know, uh, labs that you had to go through. Those were interesting, but apart from that, it was pretty much useless. Every enemy you face uh, in the game has their own unique movesets that can range from quick moves that whittle away at your health and shield, and others that are slow and more methodical. At its core, the gameplay is defined by over-the-top boss encounters, which have a pretty unique design story behind them, as instead of being drawn and rendered directly on a computer, sculptor and movie monster designer Hu Chiu Jung, famous for his works prior on Okja, Snowpiercer, actually modeled the Natibas in a, a game with clay. Like, he designed them in clay, so they had more of this grotesque, messy feeling to them. Like, they felt massy, they felt real. And the results definitely showed in the final product. So it was a pretty good decision. And this decision really helped with the feel of the Natibas. They give off this disgusting but fascinating, you know, vibe to them. Especially in some of the bosses you see in the early game, mid game, even in some of the later games. It does give you a decent variety of environments, though sometimes, you know, after a certain point, they can feel bland and lifeless like the Great Wasteland and stuff like that, it, it gets a little repetitive. But some areas, like Zion, the major city you visit, paints this beautiful picture of a desolate and hopeless society of humans just trying to make it to the next day. The game is pretty, you can't fault it on that. It's beautiful. And the one thing that ties everything together is one of the, and you can quote me on this, one of the best soundtracks I have ever heard in gaming. Like, it is so beautifully done, like, you can just leave the game running in the background while you're chilling in one of the areas, and it has this ambience to it. It really sets the tone of the game, sort of giving you this surreal, melancholic theme. Like, it, it, I, I don't even have the words to describe it. It is that freaking beautiful. And it makes sense, because it came from the geniuses at Studio Monaco. Those are the same guys that were behind the soundtrack for Nier Automata. Another great soundtrack in itself. Although I wasn't really able to confirm whether, you know, there was any overlap between the individuals who, uh, at the studio if Nier Automata and Celebrate had the same people working on it, but still, it was a great fucking soundtrack. It was a general blast and made the experience playing the game much more enjoyable during the 30 plus hours I spent completing the game and all of its side content. Though, let's be honest, it wasn't without its flaws. The voice acting for once and the delivery of those lines left a lot to be desired. Though I only played this in the English version, I don't know if the Korean or the Japanese version were any better. But the English, like, considering everything else in the environment, how, you know, the environmental storytelling and everything, it was severely lacking. And, uh, yeah, we have to talk about the weakest, weakest part of the game, which was the platforming. Research oh, look, that. platforming. Okay. This looks more like Wait, okay, factory. we're good. No, no, wait, what, what? The controls are so weird, stay in the middle. I, I understand what they were trying to go for with the platforming, but the way you controlled your main character, Eve, it always felt like you were trying to fight her for control. She never really wanted to go where you wanted her to go. <laughs> it was always a hit or miss, and there was some absolutely hilarious moments where I was trying to just, you know, stop her from jumping off the edge of a cliff, only for her to decide, nah, you know what, I'm gonna keep going. The side content, it sort of helped, you know, build on the world, but it wasn't really anything that we're not, you know, it wasn't anything special, something we haven't seen before. It was usually just, you know, go here, do this, come back, get a cutscene, all right, move on to the next one. But there was fishing, I mean, come on. Fishing in any game is generally mm, French kiss, but in this game it was especially fun. Like you could catch all varieties of fishes. So love when games have fishes. What can I say? We need more fishing in games. The main character Eve had a clear aesthetic, given the large number of outfits and accessories you could collect to make Eve your own unique character. That and um, collecting the cans, which honestly felt like they'd attempted for a product placement, which fell through at the last moment. So you just have to go around, collect cans, eventually you get a trophy, bada bing bada boom. There's also the point of Eve's character design itself, as well as many of the side characters with clear inspiration drawn from popular media, such as Nier, Ghost in the Shell, Blade Runner, and others in the post-apocalyptic sci-fi aesthetic. And while it would be later a source of controversy, which we will get into later in the video, it fit well with the futuristic setting of the world. Every single person's character had these outfits that sort of told a story, and it was uniquely done. 
Also, speaking of story, let's move on to that. <laughs> There's an interesting anecdote by Hyung Tae Kim about how he got the inspiration for the game during a taxi strike uh, due to the proposed optimization of transportation. It got him thinking about the removal of the human factor from the industry and further on about the familiar philosophical question. What the heck does it mean to be human? That is the driving force behind Shadow Blade's somewhat cookie cutter post-apocalyptic plot. It's not something we haven't seen in pop culture before. We've seen many iterations of this idea in movies, TV shows, video games, you name it. And so we're introduced to our character in what has to be, and let's just agree on this, it has to be one of the most cinematic introductions of a character I have ever seen in my life. If you didn't, no joke, if you didn't find that first scene of Eve jaw-droppingly gorgeous in terms of lighting, music and cinematography, you can leave my freaking channel. That said, the rest of you that are still here, you're cool. Please subscribe to my channel. I'd love to be friends. Share in the comments if you actually enjoyed those cinematographical moments as well. Eve's primary mission as part of the 7th Airborne Squad is to find and destroy the Alpha Nativas, super-powered monstrosities that have brought most of humanity to the brink of extinction. But her real motivation comes in the form of a revenge plot when her best friend and mentor, Taki, is brutally wounded and presumably killed at the hands of one of these nativas. Eve's allies come in the form of Adam, a bland and good-hearted nice guy character who helps Eve through the world, and Lily, an engineering support from an airborne squad that had come before her. Then they're sent to take into Zion, the last bastion of human life, as they worked to find and kill all the alpha nativas and ultimately work their way up to the elder nativa and save humanity. Decent enough plot, nothing we've never seen before. Though it is supplemented by drops of lore, dialogue, text drops from dead soldiers along the way, sort of filling in the gaps of what happened in the world to get it to this position. The plot does suffer from the fact that Eve, though very flashy and admittedly very stylish, and the fact that you know, her character helps to activate every neuron available in the human brain, is a rather bland character in her own right. The voice acting doesn't really help. She's more eye candy for most of the game with outside of a few moments of genuine emotion. But hey, at least she can kick a lot of ass and look really cool while doing it. Is that enough to overcome the lack of character? That's pretty much up for debate. But there is an argument to be made about Eve being purposely lacking in character leaning towards the, of all places, biblical inspirations behind the game. Which is pretty on the nose considering the fact that two of the main characters are called Adam and Eve, so it's not exactly subtle. But I did find this one quote from Gene Park in the Washington Post that takes this one step further by saying that Eve is, and I quote, bland by design, an obvious metaphor for the creation myth who gains personhood through the forbidden fruit of knowledge. This goes to show the game can be as deep as you want it to be, though I'm not sure if, how much I agree about that, but it is an interesting argument to be made. Because Eve does grow as a person throughout the game, little by little, showing more emotion, having more motivation to do something, even having some, like, existential conflicts by the end, but we'll get to that. Whether you're picking it up for a simple action-packed hack and slash with souls-like elements sprinkled in, or something that goes deeper than that, at the very least, it got me thinking, and when a game gets me to think, that's a win in my book. Especially considering how the story progresses to make Eve face her own humanity, with a lot of foreshadowing and exposition clearly telling us what most people figured off right off the bat. Spoiler alert from this point, um, if you haven't played the game yet and are planning on, I would skip on to this time right here, it should be on the screen. You've been warned, don't come at me in the comments, okay? Thanks. Eventually figuring out that the history of the war comes down to two factions. The Andro-Eidos, android humans that can travel in space, basically the same people as Eve. And then the Natibas, who were actually mutated humans that had to survive during the war, caused by this super AI known as the uh, Mother Sphere. It's a convoluted plot, but it makes sense when you play the game, so. Does this cause a bit of an existential crisis amongst the protagonists, realizing now that the monsters that we've been killing throughout the game turned out to be actually humans? But they decide to hunker down and go for the mission, you know, just focus, keep going forward, that all that good stuff. They do have a different perspective to show for it, so that at least they got something, you know, character development. They're, they still have to kill the Natibas, but now they feel bad about it. This leads to the final showdown against one of the main Alpha Natibas, which was the personal objective of Eve 
you know, because she killed her friend Taki and everything. And it turns out that boss is actually from the same faction as Eve. This character, Raven, who's been the one lore dumping on Eve through transmissions we find throughout underground dungeons in the game, switch sides after losing her mind at the realization that she's not human completely, but in fact that the people she's been killing, the Natibas, are actually humans. And she's killed thousands of them. Finally, the game climaxes with a choice when confronted with the final boss of the game, which Actually, you know, interesting plot twist, which I don't know, after the second ha third of the game, I kind of figured out. Turns out to be Adam himself. Look, now looking like an Abercrombie and Fitch model from the Final Fantasy universe. The choice is to either literally join Adam and become one. And not a metaphor, you literally join together. Or just flat out kill him and complete your mission. The story offers you just enough to keep you engaged. Though, nothing so special that you'd be comparing it to something like the existential dread of, say, Nier. Like, Nier was a masterpiece. Eve comes close in terms of gameplay, but for story, we're still gonna give it to Nier Automata. It also lacks the character and flamboyance. You know, the personalized character, like Eve, could be compared to Bayonetta, but she has none of the charm, none of the flair. Her moves are flashy, but her herself, bland as butter. So as we're following Eve's epic journey in this visually stunning world, you think that the game's reception would be just as awesome, right? Well, yes and no. Despite being a success in sales as a PlayStation exclusive and generally positive reception from fans, Stellar Blade stirred up quite a bit of drama with its release. The controversy really boils down to three things. The oversexualization of Eve's character, a certain unfortunate graffiti on a wall, and censorship from the publisher Sony. To start off, there was a lot of negative buzzwords thrown around about how Eve, and in fact, nearly every single female character in the game, was designed as a hypersexualized version of a woman that sets an unrealistic standard. This was going against the more, you know, woke mindset that's becoming more of a norm in gaming. And the part about that unrealistic thing is kind of ironic considering that Eve is actually modeled after a real person in Korea. This was always going to be an issue considering one of the initial videos that went viral after the demo of the game went live was the fact that the game has some very interesting physics for its characters. Yes, I am talking about the latter video. Everybody's seen it, but you know, just for clarity. That, plus the variety of outfit that puts Eve's, um, <clears throat> assets on display. Social media sure had a field day with this game. But that issue was easily resolved, you know, they get mad, they move on to the next game. It's never, you know, it's never a big deal after the first few days. Then came the day one release of the game, and it turns out Sony had secretly, in a day one patch, toned down most of the costumes, the blood, and... It, Twitter just went wild. The game had been censored, the original vision of the, pub, uh, of the developer's shift up had been hidden, and they were not happy about it. The movement was complete with its own leader in the form of Grums, who helped get the hashtag free Stillablay movement going. Really as someone who played the game extensively myself, I get that the censorship sucks, but the changes weren't so bad as to ruin the uh, experience. Like, I mean, honestly, if you're only playing for the costumes, you're missing like 99% of the content that the game offers. Sure, Eve's hot, I get it. But there's other thing the game offers as well. Then came the really bizarre accusation that the game had purposely hidden a racial slur in the form of this hard R graffiti that the player had found on one of the walls in the game. Okay, I'll be honest, before the, uh, I heard about this, I didn't even know that this word hard R was a thing. Now between you and me, I think this was more of an oversight by a design team who didn't really know what the word meant, but they changed it regardless and it turned out to be nothing more than noise in the echo chamber of social media outrage culture. And with all these issues surrounding the game, Newton's third law of motion was put on full display as every action truly did have an equal and opposite reaction as fans of the game doubled down and came out in support of the game. That factored in with the backlash by those who didn't approve of the game meant that Stellar Blade ended up getting a shit ton of free marketing. In fact, as of recording this video, Stellar Blade still sits as one of the highest user-rated video games for console exclusives ever on Metacritic. 
Just think about that. This game came out in April and it is sitting along Bloodborne, Last of Us, and other PlayStation exclusives as one of the top contenders. That is insane for a new IP. Ultimately though, Stoblade turned out to be much more than just another dose of eye candy, providing a solid experience in terms of satisfying gameplay, decent story, and jaw-dropping graphics. It was more of that last of the past style of gaming, taking us back to a nostalgic era of PS2 gaming era, era where we had games like this. Hyper stylized, action packed, unapologetically fun, hit you over the head with its sexiness and flashiness. Those were the best games of my childhood and probably some of yours. And it's always nice to see a new IP show up in this sea of remakes and reboots and rehashes. And it's even more awesome when that game absolutely fucking kicks ass and delivers a great experience. But no, that's enough for me. What are your thoughts here? Did you like the game? Did you hate it? Are you a bit on the fence about buying it? Or like me, were you, was it love at first sight? Because I absolutely fucking love this game. Uh, and I took it to New Game Plus, got all the trophies and everything. It was a fucking blast. And if you did make it to this point, uh, thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more content like this in the future, please leave a comment if you like the video and if you want to see something new in the future, some other game you want me to talk about. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out.